Good morning and welcome to this evidence session for the Committee on Standards in Public Life. The committee's role is to advise the Prime Minister and the government of the day on the processes and procedures that underpin uh, high standards in public life. We're not a regulator and we don't look at individual cases, but we advise on the procedures and processes uh, of, of public standards. For our 25th anniversary and the 25th anniversary of the first report by Lord Nolan, which proposed the creation and the establishment of the seven principles of public life, the committee undertook uh, some academic research into the complex tapestry of public standards bodies that have developed over the years. And our current inquiry is to uh, identify best practice and also any gaps or overlaps in the public standards system uh, that we currently enjoy. This morning, we are going to be hearing from uh, Peter Riddle, the Commissioner for Public Appointments. And we have on the uh, committee's side, uh, some independent members, Monisha Shah, Dame Shirley Pierce, and Dr. Jane Martin, and also uh, Margaret Beck, Dave Margaret Beckett MP, and Andrew Stunnell, who are representing the Labour and Liberal Democrat parties. This is being broadcast live through our YouTube channel. And I would just like to remind uh, new, new watchers that we will not be touching on actual cases since that's not a responsibility of the committee. And we are very much not engaging in any discussion on any cases that are currently before the courts. So without more ado, welcome, Peter. Thank you very much indeed for being with us this morning. Um, could we just could we start with the, the seven principles of public life, the so-called Nolan principles? How effective do you think that they are at providing an ethical anchor for regulation of standards? I think the, the use of the word ethical anchor is a very interesting one there, because I think what they do is provide a context and a framework um, for those actually regulating like I, I am and so on. It's more that they can be referred to. It's not that people are, are thinking about them all the time, um, although in some respects they are, because they are um, kind of decent principles for how you should behave. But they're a useful reference point. I think that, you know, the fact that in every advert for a public appointment, there's a reference to the principles is useful. Um, because if something goes wrong, you can refer to them and say, hold on, um, um, you're breaching the principles in that way. That's one level of it. it, it and I, I think there are arguments, and the, the committees looked at this, and, and the predecessor committees, and the, the, and this one, have looked at um, how are they made more operational, how people are made more aware of them at various levels. I mean, I think that, I mean, you had an interesting exchange with um, 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 William Rag on that, on, on the on the induction for MPs and so on. And I, I, I think more could be done there. The second aspect of it is how they inform the codes of people like me. And they provide a context for that. It's only a context for that. We know, we've got our own principles of governance, or rather the government has, so it's, government, it's a government code, not my code. Um, but that's quite, it's quite important. It's a starting point for a practical code if you're a regulator in an area. I mean, all the principles of, 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 of I apply in, in appointments are both consistent with and within the context of the principles of public life. Do you feel that they stood the time, the test of time well? Are there other ones that we should add? We've noted that in some other jurisdictions, there has been the introduction of a, a, a principle of respect or possibly of uh, inclusion or diversity. Do you think that they are as they need to be? Well, I, as you know, I did the training review for the Cabinet Office of the a committee going back nine years now and um that's one of the things i looked at and, and one of the original members of the committee and um, the late anthony king told me that the 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 principles were very much drawn up um without research fairly hurriedly showing the wisdom of lord nolan and his colleagues um 25 years ago um or longer uh, so the clearly it is not you know it wasn't lengthily researched or anguished over anything i think they've stood the test of time I think there is an issue about, I mean, respect, I think it's a very good point because there clearly has been, you know, as you pointed out in various speeches, um, a greater emphasis on behavior towards each other, a proper conduct. You're looking at uh, how MPs behave, um, how they treat the staffs, all that area 
um, some of which we'll be looking at later today, I think does mean respect is a good one. Um, one thing I, I introduced into public appointments was um, um, fairness. Now, you could say fairness is actually another way of saying some of the principles which are already in, in it. Mm. I found it very useful because it means equality of treatment. Now, you, I mean, you, you make a perfectly good case that the existing principles cover that. I, th I wanted it to be more explicit um, for that. When I did my re training review, I had, I had um, a, a submission from a member of the public who obviously had a, a, a gripe with his local council or councillors saying assiduity ought to be a, a principle. And I didn't think that was a bad one, but, uh, although there's a great danger of adding just for the sake of it, um, once you've got the principles. I, th I, I, I'd buy, I think respect is a good point because I think the, the debates moved on. And one of the most interesting things is how you interpret standards in public life and I think respect is more central than it was when in the mid-90s. Thank you and as it were uh, coming down from the the overarching uh, seven principles we have a framework where there are sector specific codes of conduct and then a range of standards regulators with a variety of powers some statutory some not uh, whose remit is to enforce these codes of conduct do you think this is the right kind of framework for the current challenges? Or do you think that there would be advantage in simplification or indeed centralization of regulation of ethics? I'm skeptical about centralization because the issues are very different. Um, I, I certainly think um, that, that kind of informal coordination is a good thing. But for example, the issues faced in parliament are very different from the ones I face as regulating public appointments or, for example, the Civil Service Commissioner faces. And indeed, this was reflected, actually, that there was a period of five years when the job as Civil Service Commissioner was combined with Public Appointments Commissioner, and it didn't work out. Everyone accepts that. I mean, David Normington, who you're hearing from in a couple of hours, will no doubt have views on that. But it, you know, there were two very different jobs involving very different relationships with ministers and, and, and civil servants. And, and I think certainly in you know, what more the current civil service commission and I would agree is much better that they're different jobs. And that's in a, a relatively limited area. It's certainly true that the parliamentary ones are very different. So I think it'd be very difficult to have, you know, what Tony Wright talked to you about, uh, an integrity commission. I, 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 I don't think quite that would work, which isn't to say that there, there, there isn't, there, there's a case for some simplification and also crucially a topic I know you've explored statutory backing in some cases. And I think that, that is the, 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 the clearest thing and also various other changes. I think having a single commission, as I, what one of your academic um, witnesses said, um, is quite costly. It can be quite cumbersome. It also puts an awful lot of power in relatively limited hands. Yeah. Um, because I mean, there, there, are, there are, effectively we have a system of, of vertical regulation with regulation for specific sectors and so on standing alone. Yeah. There are horizontal regulators in terms of um, EC, uh, Europe, um, human rights to some extent in respect of uh, information. Yeah. Uh, those seem to be able to operate on that, vert on that horizontal plane as, instead of the vertical plane. Yeah, no, th 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 that, that's certainly true. And indeed, in, in some of the other jurisdictions, uh, well, devolved uh, um, 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 administrations. For example, <laughs> my office number in Scotland is a standards commissioner who does um, not just public appointments, but also does um, MSPs. And in fact, she spends probably more of her time dealing with those issues um, than the appointments. And there's the fact that the appointments unit within, within it, which we, 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 we talk to a lot. So there are different models there. And I accept that, and you, you you can have it, but I think there are there are disadvantages too. And I think certainly the idea of an overall uh, integrity commission. You're right; there are horizontal models, and there, you can do that to a limited extent. Um, 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 you, perhaps you could do it more in Parliament, where there's, there's a kind of plethora of people. Um, you could simplify it a bit there. But I'm more sceptical about combining, say, having electoral with public appointments and business appointments and so on and so forth. I think you, you'd get into some problems then. Thank you. In your submission, you touched on this question of a, a clearer statutory basis. Uh, and you said that a clearer, more explicit definition of the role of codes, laying out standards in public life and setting out the powers of regulators who enforce them uh, would be desirable and that this should be via statute. 
can you talk a little bit more about what you think that needs to be done in terms of a statutory base for regulation? Well, I, it, I draw the parallel with what was all service. I mean, I, I, I heard Gus O'Donnell's um, evidence and, you know, one of his great prides is the what's popular, well, not colloquially known as the Crag Act. And what was slipped in in the right at the end of the 2000, 2005-10 Parliament was the civil service. I mean, it had been on the agenda for decades, as, as Gus pointed out. And that is, is, is a significant protection for civil service appointments and civil service, which I lack. I mean, in theory, um, the um, executive could abolish me um, at the next Privy Council meeting. They just need to um, abolish it all. Everything I work under is ordering council. Now, it's certainly true. It's difficult to change orders in council. Um, and um, it's uh, quite a thing to go through. But basically, the executive can do that. In order to change the regulation of civil service and the appointment of permanent secretaries, like, you know, an important topic in its own, they essentially, whilst there is a certain amount of um, uh, can be done on, on custom and practice, um, it, 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 to, to fundamentally alter the, the appointment, say, permanent secretary senior civil service requires primary legislation. And that is a, is a protection against just changing things. And I think that, that that's the key thing, that, that you, what you need is a combination of a basic protection, I think, from statute and flexibility in practice. I mean, the, the, you don't want something over rigid. Um, you don't want it going to the, the, the all the details. But you do want, I think, the principles accepted in statute and also the appointment, too. Um, in practice, I found that, um, for example, in my area, the code can be changed by ordering council. Now, it hasn't been since the revisions post Jerry Grimstone's review um, five years ago. And it hasn't been changed there, partly because it's, a, it's quite a, 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 a difficulty to do it. But however, it could be done. And um, there might well be a row if it happened. But I, I think the statute provides a framework for a number of the um, particularly ethical regulators. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Jane Martin. Um, good, good morning, uh, uh, Peter. Um, Hi, Jane. Uh, Thank you for your time again this morning. Um, I, I'd like to ask a couple of questions uh, which focuses on, on public appointments now and, and in particular the balance uh, between ministerial control uh, and appointment by merit, which I know is something that you, you've spoken and written about in the past. So um, my question simply is really, have we got that balance right? Uh, you know, when it comes to appointments of regular and standards, but regulatory and standards bodies in particular, what should the balance be between ministerial control and appointment by merit for those appointments? And do you think we've got that balance right at the moment? Well, this is the perennial question. If I, I think the question divides into two. One is the, the kind of underlying philosophical one. And um, I, I reread, as I quite often do, the, the chapter in the original Nolan report on public appointments. And you, you, you see the system there, which was um, essentially entirely a patronage system that the minister could appoint whoever they wanted. I remember, actually, you may hear from, from David Normington uh, later on, he recalled uh, in one of his lectures that when he was, um, a, uh, before he was a permanent secretary, when he was further down, how the old system, the pre-95 system worked. So what, what Nolan proposed was not abandoning ministerial preference, but having a constraint on it. Yeah. And the trouble is, when people talk about appointment by, by merit, it only goes so far. What you're balancing is two different things. It's not appointment by merit. What it is, is the definition, the production of the options for ministers by merit. That you have an open competition which identifies appointable candidates who are then chosen by ministers. So when people talk about politicization, I, 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 I get slightly irritated because the system is inherently political. It was always seen as being political and that ministers are involved, it's a question of balance. It's, and that's where it really comes. It's a balance between the acceptance by ministers of open competition to provide them with the appointable candidates. And that's been a consistent thread um, all the time. And it's how those constraints operate. I and mean, that's where the real focus is, where that balance lies. Do ministers accept, and also their special advisors, crucially, accept that the production of appointable candidates is, is done on a fair competition by merit, in other words, reference to the uh, criteria, uh, the person and job criteria in the advert, is it done on that basis? Which in vast majority of cases it is. 
and how what happens after that. Now, in practice, that gives an awful lot of cards to ministers and always has done, because mm-hmm. if provided someone can get over the bar of being judged appointable, um, it's up to ministers. And I, I, I frequently had to say when people have objected to people being chosen and saying, oh, it's a friend of the minister and so on. I said they were judged by a proper panel as being appointable. Um, yeah. and so the system gives a lot of cards. So it is inherently political in that way. Now, the second part of your question is, should in some posts, particularly yes. I think regulatory posts, there yes. be further constraints? And I do believe there are. I'm, I, I, the, there are two ways that could happen. Um, well, I mean, the ultimate way is you move for certain regulatory posts and defining them would be quite difficult to a kind of judicial appointments uh, system. The danger there is you get uh, uh, said some of the faults of, of, of which perhaps people can see in, in judicial appointments, like selecting like. Um, and and whilst there is a big, there is an independent element, there's an independent chair of the, of the Judicial Appointments Commission and all that, there are obviously, and also given the qualifications required to be a judge and experience required to be. And so that's one extreme. You can have a wholly, where ministers really just have a veto, um, yeah. an extremist. Um, you could have that model. You could have a one where Parliament's more involved. For example, that applies to the um, um, Office of Budget Responsibility, um, um, and also the specific ones reporting to, created by Parliament, um, like the Electoral Commission. There are also things like the um, Controller and Auditor General, who also are parliamentarily done. And th- there is an argument for Parliament having a role on that. Um, in posts like mine um, and House of Lords appointments and so on, where there's a clearly political, where, where, where you're dealing with regulation of that. It's more difficult when you get on to uh, Charity Commission, Ofcom, really powerful posts, which combine, um, uh, uh, in a sense, speaking up for the sector and regulating the sector. And there's some yeah. difficult issues there. And whether on that you make Parliament more involved, giving it a veto, say, or, you know, in other words, select committees a veto, or yes. you strengthen the independent element on um, panels to ensure that there is a very strong independent element, which I, I, I certainly, as a minimum, favour. Yes. Um, so, so just to kind of push you a little bit, I mean, that, that is a really very helpful um, explanation of, of, you know, the issues and, in play here. What's your view then of where we are now? I mean, taking on board all that you've said about uh, the right of ministers, etc. You know, very clearly put. You know, are we getting that right? What's your view? It varies. I mean, it, it, I, I mean the my view is that there are regulatory. There have been changes in the in the, in the framework since Nolan. I mean, you know, public appointments have not stood still. They were at one stage. I think they were over bureaucratized. Um, David Normington um, carried out some very welcome changes to simplify the system. I think his contribution to that is underappreciated, uh, simplifying and, and making the system work. Um, Jerry Grimstone came in and uh, proposed a very different system. However, the, the kind of basic tensions and principles remain the same, that whilst the, the regulatory changes can be there, yeah. and also it's not just the rules, it's the spirit. And what's I, what was the interesting thing, and, and I haven't talked to, to David Normative for some time, but he raised back in five years ago his worries that some of the safeguards were being removed, that um, it's possible for the government to change the code. Absolutely. But that has not happened beyond the Gribstone changes. We've had no change in the code since December 16. It'd be possible to, for example, um, the code allowed people judge unappointable to be appointed. That has not happened. Um, not for one of a bit of, you know, there have been one or two tussles and I've had to push back and say, do you really want to do this? Do you want all the publicity of it? But he was right to raise the concerns. In so many cases, this hasn't happened, partly because for quite a long period of my time as commissioner, ministers operated with restraint. But these things go in waves. Um, I think that we're now having a more, um, the current government, you know, clearly does want to have um, more, allies, sympathisers in post. Some of that is it's entitled to do and so on. Um, my concern has been they, they don't try and um, alter the balance of the system um, much. There have been one or two signs, which I, I discussed with the committee before on my letter to the committee last autumn, where they were pushing at it on selection panels. I'm, I'm, and, and there are one or two other tensions related to that. I'm glad to say that, that some of my concerns have been um, recognised and 
that are being discussed. That, for example, on a couple of areas, one was my worries over um, the kind of pre-leaking of um, a point Lord Stonnell, I know, raised with Tony Wright in, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, the leaking of preferred names. And would that deter good candidates? And we, it's, that's an interesting issue. The other one is the nature of the panels themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, where there were the attempts, to, in fact, a breach of the code to appoint people unsuitable or unqualified people to senior independent panel members. And I pushed back at that, but it produced some tension. And I, I'm glad to say that the uh, centre has responded positively to that to clarify in what I regard as a very satisfactory way to avoid those problems. But there, there, there's been other cases, including one that I raised with the committee, of what I regard as packing of panel in one case and uh, in one extreme case and in, my, in versions in other ones where, where you haven't got I, what I regard as a proper balance of independence and others. So th there is a sign that worries me. People focus on who is chosen. And I said, provided they've come through a proper system, it's up to ministers to defend. You know, I've never commented on an individual appointee, whatever I may think. Um, provided they've gone through the proper process. My worry is, is the process always going to be proper? Thank you. And just finally from me, if I may, on, again, on this quite specific point about ministerial control versus merit, um, do you think that there should be any changes on the governance code that you operate under, or indeed um, the role and the, the powers of the Public Appointments Commissioner? Uh, I mean, I'm guessing from what you said, you, you probably feel it's about right, but I'd just like to hear if you feel there should be any changes in that regard, in that particular regard. I think what I would do is more in practice. I mean, something I've learned, I mean, something which has developed over the um, role of the senior independent panel member, which is essentially under the code, someone um, where, where the department's got to get my consent on the, the appointment. It's got to be someone who's not connected to the department and hasn't got significant political connections. Yes. And also someone who is experienced in, in um, appointments and so on. I mean, it's one of those things you recognise when you see them. And there's, there'll be some really good ones. Uh, they get a letter um, about their appointments saying, if they've got concerns, they can raise them with me. I think I would now, and this doesn't involve changing the code, I would now have a more active relationship with them, which I have had with some of them. I mean, in relation to some very high profile appointments, I've made a point of contacting the senior independent panel member and talking through their responsibilities. And indeed, in some cases, they've come back to me and said, that's very helpful, Peter. Um, can I discuss things with you? We perhaps could have been more active. You can do that within the code. The one, I suppose, the, the two things on the code. Um, one is the appointing unappointables, which I didn't want, but I lost the battle on that in 2016 because it's the government's code. I think it's totally unnecessary if, if uh, uh, you know, to, to appoint someone judged unappointable by a, a, a panel appointed by a minister, you're saying an mm -hmm. awful lot. And that's why it hasn't happened, because it'd be too embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it'd also be public. I mean, my reservations would be public. I just think that's unnecessary, but it hasn't happened so far. Um, I'd rather it wasn't there. I think I'd also, on the balance of, I want more, more specific um, criteria on the balance of panels to ensure that the, there was a proper balance of independence to prevent packing. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think, um, Dame Shirley, you're, you're next with your questions. Thank you. My pleasure, Dame. Peter, thank you very much. Um, you've touched on the Grimstone Review, and um, there are a number of concerns around at the time of the Grimstone Review about um, reducing the, or increasing the risk of in, involvement in the, in the appointments. What are your reflections on that now? And um, do you feel, I mean, you've touched on some of the problems of process more recently. Um, do you think um, that's the matter that, that they would have been, the Grimstone Review has facilitated those, those problems? And is there, a, is there a, a greater role for the commissioner in the process um, than, than we've got currently at the moment? Would, 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 you, would you like to see recommendations coming for an increased role in the process? I think that the interesting thing on the Grimstone Review, looking at it, and I'm, I'm about to produce a blog, it's five years on, almost exactly five years, um, uh, on these reflections, I mean, uh, that, that, um, that some of it, you just say, for example, the replacement of independent assessors who were appointed by the commissioner to chair significant appointments. 
Um, well, that's water under the bridge on that. And that's the thing which has made me a regulator rather than part of the process. I mean, for example, my opposite number of civil service commissioner is very actively part of the appointments process for senior civil servants. And that's one of the big differences. I think that's that, that has happened. Um, I, I You can debate the significance of the change on it. I think much more. it's much more about the attitudes of ministers. On the whole, I've been impressed by the robustness of civil servants in handling panels and often their courage too. Um, in face of ministers, but it's not always so. So that's why what I would do is I'd want to strengthen the role of the independence on panels. Um, at present, I only have a, um, a, I have to be consulted and agree on the appointment of a senior independent panel member. Uh, there might well be a case for strengthening the criteria on general independent panel members. Every panel has, has to have an independent. If you're it's not just the the chair roles, the big roles, which are what is then significant appointments. <coughs> I think I'd stress that. I'd certainly remove, as I say, the appointing unappointables um, part on it. I would. Um, the, there are so many of the things are behavioural, actually, as opposed as well as as well as writing in. I think I I I, I would I say would take a more active role in relation to senior independent panel members, seeing how things have happened, strengthening the powers over that. No appointing unappointables. Probably also a behavioural thing, which it, it touches on Parliament. The select committees are very reluctant to, um, well, have been generally to um, consult me. I've always said to the liaison committee and um, PACAC, um, um, both to, and they are very keen to keep in touch with me, both Bernard Jenkins and William Ragg, over the years. Um, and I'm very keen to keep in touch with them because I regard them as my key accountabilities. One is to this committee, but also to PACAC. But the, when a contentious appointment comes up, I'm very happy to act as a kind of assurance method to say, look, this competition was well handled or it wasn't well handled. And I'm quite happy to do that. And I think a more active relationship there would be quite important, particularly for the big appointments. And how, how would you make that a more active relationship? What well, I think it, some of this is custom and practice that the, that the committees know if it's a big appointment. Part of their checklist of things to do is to get in touch with me. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we can do a certain amount on that, but I've only got two people <laughs> working for me. And, and excellent though they are, they're pretty stretched in what they do. Um, so, but uh, perhaps you know, my, my office needs to change its processes a bit too, so that we, we are there to look at um, big appointments and say, okay, that was fair enough. I mean, give an example, it worked well. There had been a lot of controversy about names being mentioned on the BBC chair last yeah. autumn, and I'm not getting into the individual case thing, but it's an illustration. And I took a close interest in that. I there was excellent senior <coughs> panel member on it. Um, I talked to him. I also, when the recommendation came, um, I looked at what had happened on the, the report of the, the, the interview panel, and I was able to write to the GCMS committee saying, I thought this was a very robust process. And um, I, I, I thought it had been admirably handled by GCMS and its permanent secretary. And you know, the choice of, uh, of, of the new chair is up to, entirely up to ministers, but in the process, it was okay. And that's an example of where I think I can provide a role. And equally, on the, on the Office of Students, something is on the record, so I'm not saying anything new, um, I could express my question marks, although the actual process of the interviews was well handled, and the senior independent panel member did a very good job um, in, in, a, in a very difficult situation. Um, but I think there, you know, m m I I'd be more active on that score. Thank you. And you say um, a strengthening of the um, pr process of appointing the senior independent mm -hmm. um, member of the panel. What, in nuts and bolts terms, what would you need to see in place to be confident that that was likely to happen? I, I think more there, I'm talking about the relationship once they're appointed, that it would be more expected that they would, they would keep in touch with me over present, it's a rare that a senior independent panel member gets in touch with my office saying, I've got to worry, or this is how it's going. What I'd want some of the assurance that it's, it's been done properly to be involved in a more regular keeping in touch with me, which some, some do, and it works, I think, rather well. In, in fact, I think it's strongly in everyone's interests. This is not me obstructing the system. It's me saying this has been done well or making suggestions or whatever. Um, and I, I would do that. I, and, I, and I say I'd broaden it on not just the senior independent panel members. I think I'd want more involvement in ordinary independent panel members 
um, but just to ensure there's proper independence in the system. Thank you. Um, just m moving on to a, a really very difficult uh, area for both public and private sector appointments. Uh, we know that teams work well when they're diverse. We know yeah. that um, homogeneity in all forms doesn't lead to the greatest decision making. How, how, what can we do? What can we recommend to help increase the diversity of public appointments? Well, that actually, in some respects, has been a success story for the last few years. I think it goes back. I mean, I'm not sure it's anything much to do with, with regulation, actually, at all. Um, I think it's more of a broader cultural changes, uh, changes in attitude in civil service. Um, and I'm, one of my roles is supposed to be champion of diversity. I don't appoint anyone, but I, I, I do devote quite a lot of my time to uh, getting involved in diversity issues. And if you look at the la my last report, it showed for the last reporting year, um, 1920, over 50% of appointees were women. This is by far the best in any, any area of public life. And this shows there's a big push in the coalition years, which Francis Maud and, and um, his team um, deserve a lot of credit because they, they did a big push there. But that's carried on. And I think that reflects as much broader societal changes and um, as well as civil service attitudes and some and ministerial attitudes, too, accepting that um, the the the. the changed role of women in public life and that's a great I think that's a success I hope it's sustainable we'll see also um, on ethnic minorities I mean I uh, the, the last figures showed 14 to 15 percent of appointees and reappointees were ethnic minorities well that is in other words in line with the share of the population as a whole I'll, and again slight qualifications um, over the figures because it was an unusual year with the general election and COVID developing at the end of it. But it, it shows that the trends are going in the right direction there. Disablement is, is much poorer. Um, and and that, that I've been very involved in. If you look at my website, I've got interviews with various disabled people. I've liaised very closely with Chris Holmes, Lord Holmes of Richmond, who did a review for the government two or three years ago on that. And we both slightly frustrated uh, at the lack of progress on disablement. And of course, the government's now introducing broader um, diversity issues, social, geographic, what they call cognitive on views. Um, I think um, there, there's lots of potential there. There's also one of the interesting lessons of COVID has been, of course, what we're doing now is remote working. And I think that there's a potential for, for to aid diversity by having more remote meetings. Um, um, if you're if you're a carer, if you've got responsibilities to say uh, with, with with children disabled, it's often a real hassle to to travel a long way to a meeting, let alone the costs and all that. If you can do at least some of the meetings a year, I'm not saying all meetings, but let's say half the meetings of a board a year, you're you're, you're more likely to apply to join it. And I think this is a really, really important thing, which I've been pushing hard. So I don't regard these as regulatory issues, but actually on diversity, progress is made. The downside is, of course, COVID's had a big downside on outreach programmes and so on. But also, because there's been, over the last few years, such a change of ministers, it's been, whilst the government's got a perfectly sensible strategy on diversity in public appointments, a good one, I applaud it, um, but there hasn't been a political lead. And that's what I hope we'll get more of now, and so one final thing on that, which I'm I'm very keen on, we are we're a partner with the Cabinet Office and the Public Chairs Forum in a mentoring scheme, which links up some public bodies, about 20, with with what we call near misses, people who applied and didn't quite get it from underrepresented groups. This follows a terribly successful model in Northern Ireland called Boardroom Apprentice, which I've had uh, contact close contact with. And this is a way of creating a new generation of potential candidates. So I say the position on, on, on a, a diversity is, is, is not too bad. OK, but you're suggesting, I think, and um, before I hand over uh, to Manisha, am I right in suggesting that you're thinking this isn't the, a consequence where, where we've got good progress? It's not a consequence of having the rules and the, the words in the right place. It's about the leadership. Um, Absolutely. I mean, it, it, actually, it's, it's very interesting. On I, I don't regard the regulatory environment as being a significant leadership is absolute key there the whole series of initiatives which i'm sure we'd all agree on on that i do quite a lot of time to that the problem is much more we've gone through a period of considerable upheaval which has made some of the initiatives much more difficult peter thank you very much i'll, I'll hand over to my colleague manisha shah 
Thank you, Dame Shirley. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Um, Peter, I wanted to talk to you a little bit uh, on a couple of issues. One was, you've mentioned quite a lot, the panel composition and senior independent panel members. In your view, how should interview panels, including the senior independent member, uh, be appointed? And do you have concerns about the way in which they are currently appointed? It varies a lot. I mean, my formal role in the code is only in relation to senior independent panel member, which, as I say, is for significant appointments, which are basically chairs of public bodies, independent regulators, that type of thing. And there, what happens is a department will come to us, sometimes with a few names, to normally informally consult and say, are these people acceptable? We do a check on um, their, um, whether they, they the, the, the there aren't any problems with them being independent of the department, with their political activity and so on, and also their experience. The other thing is, have they been used before by the same department in a relatively brief period? I mean, if they're used frequently, obviously they're not independent. I mean, they can be used by another department, but things like that. And so we have to, to um, agree to that. And you know, that's normally a straightforward process. The other members of a panel are up to the Secretary of State. Now, there are... Uh, guidelines in the code that the uh, the panel will be chaired by um, a senior civil servant um, and it, seniority varying on the nature of the, of the post. Um, um, often it's the, in some cases, permanent secretary or, or, or a director general of the department. There will be um, a senior independent panel member. There'll be, uh, and this is where it gets difficult, there'll be someone else, um, quite often from the sector, now, if you're talking about a member of a board, the chair of the board or another senior person from the public body concern will serve on it, but obviously not when you're talking about the chair of a board. Equally, you can't have an executive from the body because you can't have an executive appointing the non-executive to them accountable. And there you sometimes get, um, or perhaps increasingly get, a desire to appoint, say, a... Uh, a, a, a member of the departmental board, a non-executive member of the departmental board, who could often be have clear political links. My view on that is, okay, you do that. We should balance it with another person who's clearly independent. And this is where I think I think to ensure a proper balance. My concern is that there needs to be a significant independent voice. Ministers are perfectly entitled to have someone whom they regard as their ally and friend on the on on, on a selection panel, provided it's a chaired, which they are chaired by. Um, a senior civil servant, um, but it, that has to be balanced by having a proper independent voice or voices on the panel. But the, I, I say it's up to secretaries of state to appoint to that and uh, to appoint panels apart from getting my consent on the senior independent panel member. Thank you. Um, in that, in that, in that description. Is it the case that the presence of a senior independent panel member always ensures that therefore the recruitment panel are fair and balanced? Uh, no, because they're one member of it. But on the whole, the senior, I mean, if they're doing their job properly, and this is where I'm going back to my earlier points, of, I, 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 I think one, my office needs to develop a closer relationship with senior independent panel members um, to discuss the conduct of, of certainly high profile inquiries but the the balance of the rest of a panel as is up to a secretary of state i felt in the office of students case as i communicated to this your committee that the balance was wrong um it was clearly wrong and i was very concerned about it because it was just an extreme case in other cases i i've all i can do is kind of privately raise an eyebrow and look at the cumulative trends on that what can a senior independent panel member do well what they do do which is ensure procedural fairness I mean, I, I've seen cases where they you know, often, not so often, is to ensure that that if there's any conflict of interest between panel members and those they're interviewing, um, in some in some areas, you say that where there's a sexual representative, they'll know the people they're interviewing. And um, I remember well um, um, for one particular organisation in the cultural area, where everyone knew everyone else. <coughs> And um, it was, uh, I remember saying to the permanent secretary, you know, can't you, you know, 
I was almost fit for like, can you get a plumber on rather than um, uh, uh, someone who, who, who was so involved in that sector? And it was, it was well, the choices they made were fine. But I just felt that you, you need demonstrable independence. And sometimes you can get over chummy. And one of the things for senior independent panel member is to say, hold on, we need to be a bit of distance here. Can I, in, in that case, can I ask you a quick final uh, uh, point on this particular uh, question on this particular point? So, in light of what you've just said, and also that you have mentioned concerns before to the committee about the packing of interview, of interview panels with allies, saying that you know it stretched the governance code. Should, do you, in your view, should the commissioner or the code be strengthened or have a basis in statute a bit like the, the, the first civil service commissioner, for example? I would favour the, the um, public appointments commissioner being set up in statute with certain defined powers. I think the code has to be for flexibility reasons. I, 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 I think the principles should be in statute of fairness and so on. But uh, and that's helpful to pro provide a framework. I think the code would have to be in, in by ordering council and so on and like that. But it does ensure the code can't breach the principles of open competition. I, I would have in a statute that, you know, these appointments are made by open competition with very rare limited exceptions. Perhaps I'd give more, more power to the um, commissioner to on the exceptions. That, that would be something to do. Um, and I, I, I would do that, but ultimately consistent with the principle that ministers choose whom they want to serve in that. What one's doing is, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a winnowing down process. Um, that's where the Public Appointments Commissioner comes in. It is not taking responsibility who is picked, and that's really, really important. I mean, it'd be, it, I, I'd be in an impossible position if I was held accountable for who ministers actually pick, which some people do on, on Twitter and social media. I say, why didn't you block X being appointed? And it's slightly tiresome then to go into all the rigmarole. No, that's not my role. And nor, nor would it be suitable for someone who, who's a, a public office holder like me to do that. Can we turn briefly to uh, the question of unregulated appointments? Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, you know, we, we have all seen uh, a number of prominent unregulated appointments, uh, including in non-executive directors of departmental bodies, whom you referenced uh, a short time ago. How do you think we should approach this question of unregulated appointments? What make them acceptable or unacceptable in your view? Well, it's very, it, it, what was interesting is the original Grimstone Review actually recommended all appointments should come within my, made by ministers, should come within my remit unless there were specific ex exceptions. The, um, um, a lot of government departments didn't like that because uh, they like to pick and choose which should be regulated. Now, in practice, the most of the most significant ones are, and also new bodies come in. I mean, you know, there's a regular flow of, of, of new bodies which I regulate. Um, Give an example, the Trade Remedies Authority, which is a kind of post-Brexit one in the Department of Trade. That's absolutely fine. Um, has been well handled by the Department of Trade. And there are a number of other new new bodies coming along, uh, some of the commissioners, um, which have been established. The problem is, um, on unregulated ones, I mean, I'll come to non-executive non non-execs in a minute, because it's a bit of a separate category. No one knows the, 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 how people are appointed, who they are. Um, also, the definition, I mean, essentially, the category in my area is they should be permanent bodies. So short term reviews, you know, if a minister wants someone to do a review for six, nine months, 10 months, that's fine. That shouldn't come into my area. And when they establish, but then you get grey areas of czars and other things. And that's the problem. But there's no list of it, nor are, whilst there are some principles, as I say, you know, it's a permanent body, it's not a um, a, a temporary inquiry, you know, I, I have nothing fortunately to do with public inquiries, things like that, um, um, uh, or, or, or that. So the, 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 there are some guidelines, but also grey areas, and also just not, um, no one has a list. I, mean, I was talking to one department, which is, which is involved in the kind of post-Brexit process, which is setting up lots of advisory committees, perfectly legitimately, no one says that. 
I, uh, no one really knows how they're being done. And in fact, they've got an appointments unit in this department, which is actually far busier with unregulated appointments to, to do with Brexit advisory committees on this and that. In other contexts, they might be regulated. So I think there needs to be not that uh, it's more these things grow up and no one particularly focuses on them. The cabinet office does its best. And I've got no criticism of the cabinet office, which is very assiduous on these things. But we need clarity. So I would, what I'd want is a kind of doomsday book of all appointments, both regulated and unregulated. There are also, there's another kind of gray area, which is I'm supposed to do non-executive roles. There are also some executive roles uh, which we do and some we don't do. I mean, classically on the Bank of England, we don't, I don't do the governor deputy, or deputy governors, but I do the, rest, do the rest of the court of the Bank of England. There, there are lots of anomalies like that. So clarity on non-executives, there was a debate, non-executive departmental board members, there was a debate in 2016 whether they should, they should come within my remit. Jerry Grimstone actually recommended they should. The view was they were, they were too much matters for Secretary of State choices to, to do that. What's happened in the last year, that not just being business experts and business experts on running big things, HR, IT, but they've clearly been political allies. Uh, no one knows how they're appointed. Some, sometimes there's references to direct appointment. Other cases, it's said there's a competition. No one knows what form of competition that is. So again, clarity, transparency, not saying they shouldn't be appointed by ministers in the way they are, but we just need to know. And I, we don't know now. Manisha, you are on mute, but... Um... Beg your pardon. I was just saying uh, thank you very much, Peter. That that's the end of my questions, Chair. Thank you. I think we now move on to Dame Margaret Beckett. Can I just say that we are unfortunately heading towards the time that we need to move to the next witness. So I'm afraid the next couple of questions will need to be relatively brief. But Margaret the answer is brief too, Johnson. That would be appreciated. <laughs> I'm, I was very mindful of the time. Um, I just want to focus you for a moment more, Peter, on standards regulators. Yeah. Um, in your written submission, you say there ought to be a stronger guarantee of independence. And all the way through, you've talked about independent members, senior independent members, et cetera, et cetera. And that that should be um, stronger when it comes to the appointment, particularly of standards regulators. What, what would that stronger element look like and how would it differ from what happens now? What I'm talking about there is essentially it's how people are appointed and the number of them that, for example, when I was talking in reply to earlier questions on panels, that if a minister wants to appoint a departmental board member, it has to be from a different department, you balance that with an independent member. So I'm not saying I, I'm all in favour of, of, of um, um, uh, and such ministers having their own people, because that gives ministers confidence in the process. But it's a balance. So you would have an, uh, 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 with an independent, it's clearly someone who hasn't got attachment to the department or to a party. That's the criteria I define on that. Um, doesn't mean they can't be involved in another department or whatever. And that not necessarily appointed by me, but being approved by me me in that sense to be satisfied that they're independent and it's a balance what i regard it's a balance between the political the minister's eyes and ears the minister which is quite right i'm you know th these are processes are inherently political but it's a question of balance of the two could i just press you on one specific point do you think that former politicians who may have a clear partisan affiliation should be eligible to be appointed as the chairs of standards regulators? I, I, uh, this is a very, very interesting issue. Um, I think there probably has to be a gap. Um, I, 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 I think many, many former politicians, <laughs> former ministers have, um, are very suitable to run public bodies. I don't object to that. I mean, the people object to that, I don't. I think some of them are excellent at running public bodies and it's really good cases. Similarly, that's why I say when people talk about politicization, I've got no objection. And some, there's some really good cases of, of great successes on that, uh, who've done a really good job in, run, in, in running public bodies. I think there probably needs to be um, a bit of a, a, a gap between having served as a minister, say, which is like, the main thing, and being appointed to something, I, I think you need a, you, you, you need you need a break. There's a separate issue, um, which I shouldn't get into, but is a live one, of those who are in the House of Lords and can carry on taking a party whip, 
uh, holding public appointments, and that's an issue of some difficulty and delicacy, which I think I think does need to be addressed at some stage. And do you think any of this would be helped by there being a greater role for Parliament? I think it helps, yes, because. Uh, you know, you and your colleagues are pretty shrewd about the world. And um, I was very struck, for example, by the evidence of the of Tony Wright, um, 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 Ben and Jenkins and William Ragg. Um, you know, the, these, are, these are shrewd people who understand you know, a lot about how the world works and the balances. And I, I actually largely agreed with um, a lot of what they were saying on the balance between political and independence on that. So I think Parliament has a role. I also think that in things like the Office of Budget Responsibility, um, and other appointments, in some respects, giving Parliament a veto on appointment. Some respects, I mean, there are some direct parliamentary appointees, for example, um, the new chair of the Electoral Commission, John Pollinger. You are on mute, Andrew. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I think I was... Uh, sorry, Peter. Um, do you have any concerns or worries about the other standards regulators that you want to share with the committee, the independent advisor, perhaps, or a COBA, for example? Um, I think on the independent advisor, I, what I, struck me, I mean, I, 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 I tend to go with, with the, the evidence on, on, on that. I mean, the, 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 it struck me as two key points in what Alex Allen, Philip Moore, and then the cabinet secretaries and form, well, the former cabinet secretaries said, was... Yes, they should be allowed to initiate. Um, two, they should. Um, there should be graduated penalties. I think very strongly that the great danger of seeing if there's a breach of the code, it's any resignation, is not helpful, and um, it, 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 it's it's too much of a kind of nuclear option. The the world is more more uh, isn't quite as clear cut as that. So I think the points they were making, I agreed on the one. Slight caveat, whilst I agree with what um, the the former independent commissioners and Gus O'Donnell was saying about initiation of uh, inquiries, there's a problem there. It's that they'll, they'll be inundated by demands from every group that anything that goes wrong, rather like um, um, your committee does, even though you keep saying we don't look at individual cases. If there's any scandal, you, you know, what, what, what's the committee on standing public life doing? And you, you, you can protest um, and, and say, no, we don't do individual cases. It'll be quite difficult for the, um, uh, the ministerial advisor to say, no, I'm not doing something. Quite reasonably, they'll be, it's quite difficult. In a sense, the current system of and protection, I'm in favour of changing. I think they should be able to initiate, but they will face the problem of being having demands all the time. You know, X or Y MP will get on to them saying, why aren't you looking at this? So they'll have to be very robust on that. It's not straightforward. On Akaba, I, I um, don't particularly... I mean, all, all I can say is I think... I've got enormous sympathy for the people administering Akaba who are always being attacked. They're, they, they are operating with integrity and best will in the world, a very difficult and, 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 and partly flawed system, which is trying to reconcile different expectations, different principles with very few sanctions. And I got a lot, I mean, you know, I think successive chairs, Angela Browning and Eric Pickles, uh, and, their, and their staffs are trying to make their best of a, a flawed system, which governments, is never in government's interests to tighten up. And I think that's their difficulty on that score, as you'll be hearing in the next hour. Thank you. Just a very quick supplementary on your first point. Uh, as far as the independent advisor goes, uh, would a, a filter which might uh, avoid the trouble you're foreseeing be that simply he could make public a recommendation to the prime minister that such an incident should be investigated. So at least it was in the public domain that the prime minister's uh, judgment was being uh, tested uh, in deciding not to proceed with an inquiry. You mean that if, if, if it says, uh, the problem there is, it's like the standards in the Commons that, you know, do you look at things which are being alleged not, not being inquired into? It's very difficult. Does, is a credibility left to an allegation if, if the advisor says, no, I'm not looking at it? It's quite difficult though. I can see the attractions of what you're saying, uh, Lord Sunnell, but I think it, it, it's not, to say you're not doing something often is as difficult to say as you are doing it in, in, in some respects. It's not straightforward. Okay. Uh, a very quick catch-all. Is there anything else you want to tell us? Uh, no, not really. I think that it, it, what I, the, the, the basic thing I, I'd say is a lot of it is, is, all I'm talking about is depending on behaviour. 
I would favour a statutory backing for what I do, but a lot of it is the, is the attitude and will of ministers. And a lot of my job, indeed as predicted by David Normington, as he may say later, is, is the changes in 17 has made me, my role more public than his role was. He was dead right in that prediction because in order to push back, sometimes you've got to risk raising the profile uh, on issues, but it's behavioural as much as the formal rules um, is the key to it. It's the attitude of ministers. Are they willing to make the system work? Because they are the ones who are in the driving seat on it. Thank you. Peter Riddle, thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating session. Pleasure. And uh, we are very grateful for you making the time.